And welcome to this week's episode of No Bullshit Talks, where I'm joined here today by Jonathan McFarlane, who is the Director of Strategy at Hybrid Marketing Company. Welcome. Hey, thanks, Sabrina. I'm excited to be here and have a conversation with you today. Thanks. And actually, I should really also say that he's also joined here by Gizmo. Is that right? Yes, that's Gizmo. <laughs> you can see him there. He's, he's uh, a, a he's fuzzy so little guy. Cute. And those of you who are just Half. listening, then I feel sorry for you because you can't see his really, really cute face. But, you know, he's <laughs> well, been really quiet. He's half, uh, half poodle, half schnauzer. He's about 12 oh. pounds. So you can kind of imagine what he looks like. He's I guess. Like golden brown and he's super cute. And he's just looking at you so adoringly. And it's really sweet. Very snuggly. <laughs> yeah. Very, very snuggly little guy. Well, for the listeners, if, if he barks and gets excited, then maybe that, then you'll realize that's, that's who's, <laughs> that's who's also here. <laughs> but <laughs> right. I want to, I want to talk to you about, so hybrid marketing company, you guys are a marketing agency, but you have an ultra niche specialty and that you that's niche right. down and you market just for the cannabis industry, right? That's right. Yeah. The, the cannabis industry is growing really quickly across the u.s and we're based in colorado which is where it actually started and um yeah i mean you probably hear a lot that being an agency for everyone is a really really tough thing to do and so when we were trying to decide well what what do we want to do what kind of agency do we want to be this is um something where a lot of us have already had expertise and you know just kind of grew organically i guess you could say when you say expertise, does that mean you all just smoked cannabis before? Is that what you mean? <laughs> well, I, I, so, you know, it's kind of funny, actually. Before I got into the cannabis industry, it was definitely not my thing. It wasn't really something I was interested in. It wasn't something that I used really at all myself. Um, you know, like college was different, but that was 20 yeah, years ago. <laughs> um, yeah, Yeah. So uh, it, it just, it's just sort of like, my skills worked in this industry and it's, it's small enough and new enough to where, you know, two or three years and all of a sudden you're like a veteran where you talk <laughs> about like, like the CPG or, or like tech space or something like that. And people are doing it for a lot longer before it sort of, they sort of like hit their stride. So um, like many people, you know, I was looking for a new opportunity and this is where I found it. I'm so glad you said about how agencies should not be for everyone. And I think that's what so many people miss the mark when it comes to any sort of marketing or any business, right? And, you know, that's what where we went wrong. When when I first was running my agencies a few years ago, we were the most generic agency. You know, we did everything for everyone because we thought that if you have as many people in your target audience as possible then it means more opportunities of business and then what we didn't realize that you just lost in this sea of people and you're not really distinguished between all the other agencies that are doing exactly the same thing so you know a right. couple of years ago we we completely rebranded and that's when we became the no bullshit agency and hence like no bullshit talks and we're on that today and staying true to brand but you know it's controversial right so when we launched people were just like the first thing you see on your website is like an obscenity <laughs> and it's like what the hell and they're just sort of like that and and to some people they were like oh that is so unprofessional and a lot of people will still say that oh you know you're alienating a lot of people because of your brand and it's like but i was like but the people who come to the website and that like it they love it they connect with us and they're like right these are my kind of people and i i need to pick up the phone now and like they become instant customers we don't even need to sell to them because they look yeah. at the site they're like this is so refreshing they're so different and they know what they're gonna get and and it, yeah maybe the the really professional standard corporate people aren't gonna like it but they're not our, our target audience and it took us a while to get there but i think that's got to be the right approach Oh yeah, for sure. And you know, it's kind of funny. Um, we have a page on our website that is literally titled shit we're good at. Yeah. And other than the home page, like other than the, just the, the standard front page, that is the second most trafficked page on our entire website. Um, and it's for the same reason that you're talking <laughs> yeah. about. Like we, you know, it's, it stands out. It's, it's unexpected. And I mean, that's, that's half the battle is just standing out. It is like that's what that's what I consistently tell clients as well on a daily basis. It's like, 
okay, so you're doing this other product, which, okay, another 75 other people are doing in the vicinity of your area. How on earth do you stand out? Yes, you could go cheap, but again, you know, you're standing out sort of for the wrong reasons, but also even if you had, a, if, if someone had a product that was more expensive, they're not going to leave that product they know and love and trust for this unknown new product, even if it's slightly cheaper, you know, mm. so it's, 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 it's a really tough thing to do, but I thought it was interesting that you kind of specialize in cannabis and I guess, so what, what, what was a conversation with you like then with you guys, how did you decide to niche down in that? What, what was it about? How did that come happen? Yeah, so the the agency started a few years before I joined up, um, and it was it was initially a much more generic agency, kind of like what you're describing. Um, and then somebody that joined on brought a cannabis client with them that they had been working for elsewhere, um, and and then I had joined the industry working in Canada uh, uh, as the director of marketing for a. Uh, a cannabis business that makes really large harvesting equipment for the industry. And so that was how I got into the industry. And then hybrid sort of poached me, I guess you could say, um, convinced me to move back here to Denver and join up. And when I sort of started talking to them about this, um, knowing that they had a cannabis client and now I have a, a lot better understanding of that industry after being in it for a few years, it was sort of like, well, this for me is the path of least resistance. Like if you want me to help bring in business, it's got to be cannabis because that's what I know really well. That's the industry that I feel most comfortable in. And that's also where I see the most opportunity compared to what they had been doing the other side of the business, which is really just sort of that generic catch all. And that makes it so hard to sell. Well, just like you're talking about, you're trying to just sell to everybody. It's really difficult when you're trying to sell to a very specific group and you know what they're interested in, you know what they need, you know the tactics that work, you know the messaging that works, you can speak their language. That is just so much easier and just so much more effective. And so um, our president, Greg, he, he was like, that's what you want to do. Let's do it. And he just kind of let me run with it. And that's the part of the business that really took off. And so that's why hybrid really became this cannabis focused entity. Wow. And so what exactly do you do for these cannabis companies then? Like, okay, marketing agency for cannabis companies is quite vague. So what exactly do you do for them? Yeah. So we're really like a, a bespoke type of agency. I mean, what we do for each client is truly different for each client. Um, so we don't, we don't talk about like one specific tactic being a specialty. We talk about the industry as a whole being a specialty. So for some clients, you know, it could be design work, could be email marketing, could be uh, lead generation. You know, it's kind of on the outskirts of what we consider marketing, but still. Um, so we do, we do webinars for some clients. We do a lot of long form content for like business to business clients, you know, guides and like checklists and that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of copywriting, a lot of design. So um, printed, programmatic, a lot of creative work, even video. It, it is truly like any sort of tactic you could imagine we deploy. But um, part of another part of how we differentiate ourselves, even in the cannabis industry for our, from our competitors, is that we see ourselves as um, more of a strategic partner that then executes rather than the other way around. So our ideal clients uh, are the ones that come to us knowing that they need help, knowing that they need marketing, or maybe they need branding, but not knowing past that point. And that's where we come in. We learn a lot about the business in a really deep way. Deeper, We go deeper than most agencies do, and we create a, a plan specifically for them to help them meet their goals. Um, and as much as I love beautiful websites and really great design, and you know, we always try to connect what we're doing back to business drivers, increasing revenue, reducing risk, things like that, that, that the C level, that that's kind of the language of the executives like to speak, mm. you know, like they don't really care that much. If the website is beautiful, they care if it does what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, that's kind of how we approach things is just this really custom kind of thing. We don't, we don't do like different prepackaged lines of service or anything like that. 
when you say like guides and webinars and stuff, I was thinking, what kind of guides do you do in the cannabis industry? Like a guide to how many joints it's going to take me to smoke before I get sufficiently high? Like I'm trying to work out what, what guides do you have in the in cannabis industry? What content goes out there? Like, I mean, it's just, I, I can't even imagine it. Like it's crazy. Well, sure. Yeah. So I'll give you two, two examples that are completely different from each other. Okay. Um, the first one is for a dispensary client called Lightshade. They're like truly our oldest client. They're based here in Denver. I think they have 12 locations now. And we created a com uh, complete women's introductory guide to cannabis. And um, there is a printed version, but that's not really why we did it. It, is, it. it exists on their site as this enormous pillar page. I think before we even added imagery and links and video clips and stuff like that. I think it was 36 pages typed, you know, before we actually turned it into the page. Um, and, and for them that that's, that's really useful. I mean, it's, it's a useful tool to send out to newcomers, but also um, for SEO purposes, really useful for that. And we even used it in programmatic campaigns too, like, you know, read the new in, uh, women's introductory guide to cannabis because a, a lot of the dispensaries are still fighting for those people that are interested, but a little nervous, you know, like not really sure what to expect, not really sure to approach this whole thing, but for one reason or another, they're, they're trying to learn a bit more about it. And so um, that was the purpose of, of that guide. A completely opposite uh, type of thing would be for, um, well, from the company I work for in Vancouver, Mobius Trimmer. So for them, we created a number of guides that were buyer's guides for the type of equipment they produce. So for example, they produce a, um, uh, a very large scale cannabis trimmer. I mean, you know, like trims hundreds of pounds per hour. And it's, it's a very high, these, these kind of things are, are expensive. I mean, it's like 40 grand, that kind of thing. Well, of course we want to we want to feature them heavily in anything we create, but we created a guide that was a buyer's guide to large scale cannabis trimmers so that somebody is in the market. This includes Mobius. And of course, you know, like we kind of make it look the best, uh -huh. but actually mentions all of the other competitors, uh -huh. um, pros and cons of each um, costs, weights, performance, like all the different KPIs in each machine. And it's a PDF that lives on the website with a landing page. Like if you want to download it, you just put in your credentials and now that person is a lead. Um, and it's been really successful for them. I guess that makes sense. Cause obviously people who are growing their own stuff and they need to know and get the right tools. And obviously, like you said, it's expensive. So it's a, an investment. And I think something like that's great that you said you include competitors. So it seems fair and like an honest mm -hmm. kind of review. I'm still trying to work out what's in that women's guide. Like I can't, I just can't imagine it. Like, like a women's guide to getting high, basically. I've got to read that guide, by the way. So I'm, I'm I will send you a link. I will send you a link. Yeah. <laughs> I and, need to uh... know what's in it. <laughs> I'll send it over to you. Hopefully you find something <laughs> useful, but um, you know, like that guide is really geared towards people like my mom. So my mom, no interest in cannabis whatsoever, but she's yeah. had a sleep, like a problem sleeping for her whole life. She's always had trouble sleeping. She's used all the different medications, prescription ones that are really like not good, um, very addictive. And so this guide was something where she could, explore other, maybe other categories like edibles, that kind of thing that are not traditional, like not smoking, not that kind of thing. I mean, it's, um, it's just, it's an entry point. If you don't know what you're doing, but you want to learn more, that's what it is. It's me. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm going to read it on the way to Amsterdam. Cause you know, that's, that's where it is. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> It makes so sense. My, It'll be good reading. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be good playing material. That's great. Um, but okay, let's talk about, you know, legalities as well. Because obviously, like Colorado totally makes sense. Like you guys are the first state, right, to kind of legalize mm -hmm. it all. I remember that. Um, I, I think right. I was I was out in the US then um, when it was all happening. And um, I had a friend who was like uh, studying Colorado. And he was like so happy when he heard that. <laughs> <So it was laughs> like, I think he became like everyone's dealer at that point. So it was like, <laughs> but what is the attitude like? Because, you know, I still think that, 
there must be a lot of what you do there must be a huge education point about it because there must be still a massive proportion of people who are just still like this is still a drug like it's still wrong to give it to people and obviously there's medicinal marijuana but then there's also like people taking it recreationally but it's but it's legal in some states and it's just a whole mixed bag of stuff so what's the what is it like with the attitudes like first of all i guess in colorado where you guys were kind of the pioneers for this and then say spread out into all the other all the other states like what what is the attitude like yeah well here in colorado i mean we're 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 just we're basically a decade since adult use legalization so i mean here it's pretty normal like talking about working in this industry it's sort of like I don't know, do you work in the alcohol industry? It's like the same kind of thing, it's the same kind of vibe. Um, going to a dispensary here, it's not like a, a cool and edgy thing to do anymore. It's just a thing that people do. Like if you're gonna go buy your six pack at the uh, liquor store, you're gonna stop by the dispensary. It's, it's very Easy. normal. Um, <laughs> the, the attitude here is pretty accepted. And, and part of that comes from the community and the conservatives who normally, this is like not their thing, they see the impact that it has, like the tax dollars that are generated, the revenue that are generated for our state from the cannabis industry is really a lot of money. And that goes to policing, that goes to schools, that goes to healthcare. It 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 has actually really helped revitalize towns that were kind of disappearing off the map. So it's been a net positive, and I think most people in Colorado agree with that. But to your point, it, it is really different from state to state. And I think the attitudes, it's more of a regional thing than anything else. Like um, if you go towards the South where it is still for the most part, although changing there now too, but still for the most part, very illegal and very frowned upon, uh, it, you do still get that, like you guys are taking drugs, you're promoting drugs, you're selling drugs, you still get that attitude um, pretty significantly down there. But you know, that's, it's, su it's such a, it's such the wrong approach because those are places where um, overdoses of other drugs like meth and fentanyl are through the roof. So the approach they've been using for, for forever to combat drug use is clearly not working, um, especially in those areas. So um, it just takes time. You know, eventually it will be fully legal here. The dominoes are continuing to fall and it's not going to go back the other way. So um, it's, you know, another, another decade, I'm sure, I'm sure it'll be pretty normal pretty much everywhere in the US. Do you think so then? Do you think that's actually going to be the case? Do you think that, you know, in every state in America, you'll be, there'll be, it wouldn't matter to people. They will think it's completely fine. Like I said, as, as they see it the same as alcohol, do you actually think it will get to that point? I do. I think, I think for everybody to see it the same as alcohol might take even longer than I'm saying, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I really do think eventually it's going to just be a pretty standard, pretty normal thing that people do pretty, pretty accepted. Um, I think federal legalization is maybe a little further off than people have been talking about. And that'll be a gradual process. It's not just going to be like one day, it's just legal everywhere. You know, they're going to take steps decriminalization and then maybe they open up things like uh, like banking and insurance other more mainstream industries are allowed to get in um, but eventually it's gonna it's gonna happen I mean most states now have some sort of legalized system if you include medical as well mm. there's only a, there's only a handful of states that don't have anything at all so um, and the money's out there I mean that's the big thing like politicians love money so if you're donating to their campaigns um, and you're, you're lobbying on behalf of your industry and you have the financial backing to do that, well, that, that really matters. Um, and, and this industry does have that and is starting to get more of that now too. What about outside of America then? I mean, I don't know if you've managed to come across anyone that's, you know, you've come across anyone that's outside of the US, but what do you think their attitude's like towards the industry? And, and do you think that it's going to ever be globally legalized? You know, it's hard to say looking outside of the US. Um, we've worked with clients in Canada, obviously. It's federally legal up there. And it's been a, it's been a net positive, I think, for Canada. Um, but I don't know globally if it's ever going to get that way. I mean, there's parts of the world that you can't drink alcohol. 
know, right, right. just so, like where there's religious tradition yeah. and so on that really restrict you from doing that. So will it ever be accepted globally? Probably not. But I mean, nothing is accepted globally. No. No, I guess not. I guess like those countries, are, if they're not going to accept alcohol, they're not going to ever accept cannabis to be normal. But I feel yeah. like a, a lot of places do. I mean, that we've had a, a few clients in the UK who have, um, you know, who've come to us for medical cannabis stuff as well. We've been doing that sort of thing for them, and we've done their branding. We've done like you know design stuff and marketing, and and it is always around an education piece because I think that the attitude here is generally it's generally frowned upon. Don't get me wrong, like like most drugs and alcohol, it seemed as cool in in certain groups of people, but obviously in general, I'd say that it's definitely frowned upon, and I I can't even imagine like a time where you just it would just be so normal to go like you said to go pick up a go pick up a, a, a like you know a dosage in a in a pharmacy or whatever I just I can't imagine it, it it's kind of crazy thinking about it you just got to come visit Colorado <laughs> I've seen three see. I've, I've seen it in the US like I've been over there and I'm like okay. this is fascinating and it's like you've got a whole store of like different strains and stuff to like choose from and it's like a mm. candy shop basically yeah it's or really like a deli bizarre. or something like that yeah, yeah totally i'll yeah. have a you know a bit of that one and that one you like weigh it all up and it's like you know, a little deli meat counter i totally get it it's just a bizarre phenomenon i just can't imagine it here though like it's just it's strange and yeah i just can't imagine what people think about it as well like for example what do your parents think about you working in the cannabis industry? Because I feel like the next generation up are a little bit more funny about it. Like, what do they think? Oh, hi, mum and dad. This is what I do for a living. Yeah. What was their reaction? <laughs> well, I think my parents have just always kind of been supportive of whatever weird cor correction comes to my career because it has <laughs> taken a lot of very weird twists and turns. Um, and they've kind of always just sort of supported whatever I want to do which is incredible. I'm, I'm so lucky to have that kind of, you know, that, that, that uh, support from my parents. Um, and yeah, my, my dad, no interest whatsoever in actual cannabis use, but he's interested in the business because it is kind of weird. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's new. So he's always asking me, how's things going or what's new with this client or whatever. Um, and my mom, on the other hand, though, she, she is now a cannabis user um never ever could have imagined that even a few years ago but um but it was for her it was the sleep thing like she she like i mentioned she tried all these medications over the years and none of them worked and she never had and nor will she ever any interest in smoking anything so for her the the way she consumes cannabis is like a, a gummy like a small edible she'll take before bed and so you know, for her, cannabis means sleep. Cannabis means like waking up rested and feeling normal. Um, you know, like the alternative was, what's the one? Oh, like Ambien that she mm. was taking. You know, that's strong stuff. It makes you it, drowsy it can, as hell, right? Right. Like it, it can mess you up pretty good. Mm -hmm. And so this she sees as a more natural way to do it that with less side effects. And, um, you know, I mean, if somebody wants to make that choice from a pretty significantly strong uh, pharmaceutical to something like a microdose gummy, I don't know why we would discourage them from that. Well, I feel like um, in the UK, CBD is the cool thing, right? Because we don't have we don't have legal cannabis, so those people who want to have who have sleep problems and they're trying to find these solutions and and just like that there's like i guess all the different th things that people talk about like aching joints and all these mm -hmm. kind of things right they they go for cbd and it became a thing right that everyone's making stuff from hemp or like cbd oils and and they suddenly it, it was maybe it's about five years ago now when it first started being really popular and trendy it's still happening but i guess it's more normal now um yeah. but what do you think of like the cbd industry is it just like a gimmick they're trying to jump on that and like or do you think their products actually work like what is what is your what are your thoughts compared to like the actual real cannabis industry yeah so the cbd industry here is really competitive it's really really saturated 
So, um, so anybody that's listening that is interested in getting into that industry, I would say probably don't (laughs) because it's very, very difficult. Um, we have clients, uh, that, that work in that industry specifically, like that side of the industry, I guess you could say, and it's, it's really tough, um, just because it's so competitive, but in terms of the products themselves, and if they actually work, um, it, it does seem to be different for everybody. You know, like I've taken CB, CBD products for sleep that helped me fall asleep for sure. Um, but then I've also taken them with the intention of like fixing up my knee that's always stiff and they haven't seemed to do anything for that. Um, but then, I mean, you might talk to somebody else that, that, that had a, an aching joint and they're like, it was like a miracle cure. So I think, um, I think that the verdict is still out on CBD products, what they can be used for, what they can actually do for you. Uh, but I will say there is, there is now FDA. So like our like a pharmaceutical governing mm-hmm. body um, approved medicines with CBD in them for um, epilepsy. I think it's called Epidiolex. And, you know, it's gone through the whole FDA approval process and it's been proven in lots of different studies to actually help kids that have this severe form of epilepsy. So there is something to it. You know, I mean, I think the jury is still out on what it's good for and what is actually hype and what kind of dosages are effective and what aren't because the, the, the way it's been studied is kind of all over the map. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, people are still buying it. So there's yeah, that. Yeah, it's because they design it really trendy. Like, I mean, we've done some stuff, so I know it, it looks trendy. Like all the packaging's really cool. Like, so I live um, near Shoreditch in, in London, which is the trendy hippie part of London, basically. Okay. And it's like, a, there's a CBD <laughs> shop, like every two meters, I swear. Like really? it's like CBD slash vape, like all along and vintage clothes stores. And that's what like the whole lines of streets are. So it's very hippie and trendy. And I swear like everyone I knew was creating their own CBD product at some point just like everyone's making gin a few years ago as well like it became this big <laughs> like trend and it's like oh this is what's really cool now and everyone just kind of got into it and i and i and i think it, that is just that like it's it's a trend but like then all these people swear by it and they change their lives and like you said like they know they couldn't sleep and it cured them and their joints and and you know there must be something in it i mean i tried some stuff because i had insomnia for a while didn't really help like i had knee surgery didn't really help so you know and actually someone the, one of the clients was saying to me oh we should really give you a, a prescription for medical marijuana that's what they said to me and i was like but they didn't sadly but like that would have been interesting to try <laughs> but um but you know like i that would have been interesting to see if it actually did work because you know it's it's they talk about cbd as the safe option it's got another thc or whatever but you know a lot of people say oh that's the good bit or whatever and i feel like there might be some sort of placebo effects as well with the marijuana and and but you know there's also the danger that comes with it because if you're going to be reliant on something it is a drug just like people forget that alcohol is also a drug like if you take take that all the for time sure. and you're doing that every day to because people use alcohol as a drug for depression right it's like they have a hard day they're like oh, a glass two three like you know whatever it takes to kind of numb that pain you're not actually yeah. solving the underlying cause but you just kind of it turns into a problem and right there must be loads of that and again like how do how do these companies control that sort of thing there must be loads of legal requirements around what they're talking about because by selling this stuff they're gonna end up people getting addicted to it like yeah well and and the the there's studies out there that show that physical addiction to cannabis is pretty hard to do you can totally be mentally addicted to it but, but it's not physically addicting the way that a lot of other drugs are. Like, it's not like crack or something. You hear people that have used crack and it's like one hit yeah. and they're, they're addicted. It's, it's not that kind of thing. So, you know, just like anything, intentional use is important. And like, you know, why, why are you using it? Uh, and, and if your answer is, I don't know, cause I just feel like getting high, that's okay too. Yeah. But understanding why you're using it, like, making sure that it's not something that you have to have. Um, and a lot of that comes back to education. Like you were, you were talking about that, that is a part of it. Um, but here's, here's the reality. People that are reliant on alcohol 
a lot of those people are trading for cannabis. We're seeing that constantly. Um, and we even did a challenge for one of our clients where they were asking people to, you know, people that drank wine, let's just say a couple glasses a night to start one night per week where they, t- they don't drink any alcohol, but they substitute cannabis. That was the first couple of weeks. And then it was try substituting two nights a week and three nights a week and just sort of see how you feel and how different you feel in the morning. I mean, that's the big one. Mm-hmm. You know, if you get, get, get high, like, uh, uh, unless you're getting really wrecked, like, let's just say you get <laughs> medium high, happy high. Yeah. You know, the next morning you, you probably feel fine. Mm-hmm. Whereas with alcohol, especially like myself, as I get older, I have like three beers and the next morning I'm not fine. I have four mm-hmm. beers the next morning sucks. I also, have, <laughs> I have a four-year-old, so mornings are not really on my own time. So, um, you know, I, I get why people would be trying to make that substitution. But it's okay, it, it is interesting. But does that mean that marijuana is healthier than wine? Because why are you substituting at wine for weed? Like it sounds like it's not a healthier substitute. Like I know people talk about substitution in diets, and they're like, "Oh yeah, switch out your cow milk for vegan milk." Like <laughs> open milk. It doesn't really sound like the same sort of thing here. Like surely there's there's bad points to this. Well, I mean, just like anything, you can abuse things for sure. But I will challenge you a little bit. I actually think cannabis is much safer than alcohol. Wow. So let me give you a statistic. Guess how many people died from alcohol related whatever in the US last year? I can totally believe that's a lot more than than like my one because obviously the the ease of access, the amount that people drink again, it's that acceptance, right? That people think, especially in British culture, we've got a bad rep for this, right? It's in British culture we drink at every opportunity. We drink to drown our sorrows. We drink to celebrate something. It's like it's a Tuesday, but you know, like it's there's always a reason to drink. But yeah. to smoke a joint, people are like oh what are you doing and it's that kind of you know there's that attitude as well so i can believe that an alcohol i think is one of the most dangerous drugs and the fact that it's actually probably more addictive and you know again all that sort of stuff but like so i believe that the stats of of death is probably a lot higher i guess my question is direct consummation like say if it was exactly the same of what you're consuming like say if it was just one one glass of a wine a night versus one joint a night like yeah i mean i guess i don't know i I guess i don't really have any scientific facts i can back that up with if if one is truly healthier than the other um and then there's also smoking so you're talking Mm. like it's not really it's it's never going to be healthy to smoke Mm. something i mean it's definitely healthier than actual cigarettes Mm -hmm. but you're still smoking you're still you know inhaling something that's combusted or whatever so um but compare that to an edible or something like that, yeah. where you're not actually smoking yeah. anything, that is a healthier option for sure. I mean, we all have our vices and I think it's just choosing what makes the most sense for you, what's gonna do the least amount of damage, mm-hmm. provide the most amount of enjoyment or relief or whatever it may be. Um, and for a lot a lot of people, they're, they're, they're looking towards cannabis and moving away from alcohol. Um, and you know how many people overdosed on cannabis last year in the U.S.? Zero. <laughs> Zero. I was guys. <laughs> you were right. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. But I, I can imagine that. Like, I feel like, like you said, crack. Like, that's supposed to be addictive, right? As hell. Like, it's uh, and they just want more and more. Whereas I feel like with cannabis, it's more of the relaxing thing, and it's, I guess, it's not something you're just gonna OD on per se. I can't imagine someone yeah, doing that anyway. Well, and I mean, we have we 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 have a drinking culture here in the U.S. too. I mean, it's different from what you guys do, but for sure, a lot of people drink. I like to drink too. Mm-hmm. Um, and we hear stories, really horrific stories, about young people at parties drinking themselves to death mm-hmm. because they don't know what they're doing, and they over mm-hmm. there's people encouraging them, like the frat house thing, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, um, it happens kind of a lot here, mm-hmm. and you don't have those stories with cannabis. No because you can smoke yourself into oblivion or eat way too many edibles and you might feel terrible, yeah. but it's not going to kill you. So, yeah. uh, you know, that that's a pretty, pretty important difference between the two. And I think, I guess like you're probably more 
relax and, and spaced out and you probably end up passing out and not really understand what you're go where you're, what you're doing whereas in with alcohol yeah. people are just like yeah i can fly and they jump off a roof and do something stupid like you know this is the problem or they get behind a wheel and they they go somewhere because they're like yeah i feel fine whereas i feel like i guess with when it comes to marijuana they they significantly don't feel fine but they feel relaxed and different and that's why there's that difference i think with alcohol that's i guess yeah. that's what i think but mm -hmm. but if you ever did want to conduct an experiment um you know to have someone drinking wine every night and someone drinking and someone smoking every night i'm sure you'll be able to find lots of volunteers who probably participate in that sort of experiment <laughs> yeah. with some yeah. data especially if we su we'll supply the product for free i'm sure yeah, we'll exactly. line up people interested in participating yeah so if you ever did want to do that trial i think that would be pretty popular <laughs> you get some data and i can come that's back a good to idea that. that's a good idea well you come visit in colorado and you can partake you can decide which side you there you go. that sounds good <laughs> <laughs> but i do want to know because obviously we've talked about all the legal stuff but there's gotta be a massive black market still for cannabis i mean like yes it's legal in lots of places but obviously it's not how much do you come across you know in your job the the illegal companies who are doing stuff on the black market yeah so um more a few years ago than now um, in, in, and the existence of the black market really is different from state to state. Yeah. I mean, in Colorado, it's almost been entirely eliminated. Um, prices are very, have, have gone down at dispensaries, like compared to when things first started opening up and it was very expensive. So as the prices in the dispensaries go down, um, and not just the prices, but the product in dispensary is also thoroughly tested by third party labs. So as those kind of things have all happened, there's not really a whole lot of reason for somebody to, yeah. to go outside of that infrastructure, do something illegal, which is still illegal to, to mm -hmm. buy from somebody on the street. Um, when you can get a, a tested product uh, legally, like, you know, like, why would, why would you, why would you go that route? Why would you, why would you do something illegal if you didn't have to? Um, and the prices were comparable and it's safer to go legal and so on. That's not the case in everywhere. Like places like California, California has a massive black market, uh, far bigger than the legal market, I believe. Um, and it's because really the, the industry there has truly been throttled by the, the state government in California. It's taxed so high that it's really way too expensive to go into a dispensary, you know? So if, you know, buying from your buddy down the block and it's, I don't know, you, he can get you an eight for 20 bucks or whatever, mm -hmm. and it works for you, then you're just going to keep doing that compared to going into a dispensary and getting something that's double the price. Um, especially if you're somebody that is kind of price sensitive and those, that those economics don't work for, for your situation. But most places that have an established legal market, over time, the black market does diminish. Um, Colorado, Washington, Oregon, uh, those kind of places, like states that have been doing it for quite a while, I think have mostly eliminated that black market. But you must get companies pretending to be the legit when they're not, right? Because how yeah. do people know right you said get a shiny website do all this stuff like how many people look up the license number all this kind of stuff like as a customer you're not going to i guess if you get audited you might but and there must be people out there running you know illegal businesses but pretending they're legit surely surely there are but we don't have a <laughs> lot of them coming to us okay um, i will say there's been a couple instances where we were like this doesn't sound quite right. Um, <laughs> but like, for example, once uh, this was, let's see, it was a little while ago, a couple of years ago now, but we had a, uh, we were talking to a, uh, a, a Mexican national that was, was trying to setting up a business there. And so our first question was like, well, not our first question, but one of our questions like, so like, what about the, the crime in Mexico? What about the cartels there? <laughs> he was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really just like paying taxes, you know, they're business people, you just pay the taxes, you pay the fees and you operate as you would normal, any normal business. And we're kind of like, uh, <laughs> maybe this isn't a good fit for, for us. It's like straight but, out knockers. <laughs> yeah. But we, uh, we wish you good luck. 
and we hope you do really well. But um, but no, I mean, I don't think we're interested in um, being involved in a business that needs to pay the cartels. That's not that doesn't fit in our specialty exactly. It reminds so me, it still exists. Watch, I need to watch the new epi- new season of Ozark as well. Like that's reminded me of that. Uh, I don't yeah. know if you've seen I'm Ozark. I'm behind on that. I have, but I'm behind like two seasons, I guess now. I I, I, I yeah, I just think it's quite funny how like it you could start out so innocent and accidentally end up in a in, a, in like running with the cartel it's the same as that good girls one i don't know if that one that one's popular in uh, as well because it is of, but... yep and i've i've watched a lot of that one too <laughs> it's like every show is like that now there's also some drug um, thing but that was quite funny how they are just all kind of innocent moms that end up becoming part of the cartel so it is uh it's kind yeah. of crazy with all that sort of stuff but um but yeah i think i think it's i think it's funny but how easy is it to actually set up a dispensary in the us like i mean i feel like if if someone wanted to go legit and they will say your, your local drug dealer that was just making you know like you said t- 20 bucks here and there selling to their mates but what if they wanted to go legit like what if that's a dream come true you know they don't really amount to anything at school they they were bored of it and actually that's they were they were selling drugs but now they can actually make a legitimate business out of it how easy is that you know it does depend a lot state to state some places uh it's relatively easy and relatively cheap um, like Oklahoma, for example, I think they've ch- they've changed things recently. But I mean, they their license fee for an application or for, for a, well, their for a license was only a few thousand dollars, and they had no cap on the number of dispensary licenses or cultivator licenses they were issuing. So if you wanted to get into the business, you know, like you're really just you're not paying much besides the overhead of actually operating a retail space like your your building and your your employees that kind of stuff you know like the setup costs are really cheap um but then you compare that to really tight markets that are new especially new ones that tend to not um, allow unlimited licenses and you could be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars Mm. before you even construct your building or before you even rent out your space so it it varies a lot um i will say that the dispensary game is challenging you know it's um once it becomes normal and the market is saturated and the novelty has worn off it's it's a retail business just like most retail businesses mm-hmm. where you know you're you're fighting for customers from your competitors and you're trying to think of new ways to bring them in you're trying to build loyalty um it's not it's not like a set it and forget it kind of business where you're just going to roll in money it, it can be really challenging and, and for a lot of cultivators that were sorry dispensaries here in colorado it is a difficult business if you're successful there's there's a lot of money on the table but there's a lot of businesses that either go out of business or get bought by you know a competitor or a larger organization I guess it's going to turn into an alcohol industry style sort of thing, right? Once it becomes normal and legal, but there's so, there's there's millions of alcohol businesses, and they all seem to survive somehow. So it's again, it comes down to the marketing. So, are you guys as a marketing agency for the cannabis industry, like what direction do you usually go for? Is it is it more medically oriented, or is it more the social thing? Like, say, if you were to I don't know if anyone's done this yet, but like I again, I just can't imagine sitting there watching TV and an ad comes on. It's like you've had a hard day, <laughs> like you know, come get a roll of Mary Jane from us. And it's like I just can't. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm still trying to picture that. But you know, what direction do you guys go in with the with the marketing front for these companies in order to make them sell? Yeah. So if we're talking about the like retail and actual products and set aside the B two B stuff for a minute we're rarely going the medical direction. Um, in fact, I can't think of any instance where we've done that. It's almost always the other direction. And we've got some experience where we're taking medically focused businesses and turning them into recreationally focused businesses. Wow. Um, because it's once, when you have a medical system, like just medical system, then it's, it's, it, the language you use is similar to any kind of medical. You like you talk about patients and you talk about um, symptoms and things like that. We you kind of get in a dangerous game there. What kind of medical claims are you making 
um, because you you want to make sure you're you're not saying like this is going to treat your glaucoma, this is going to help your stomach issues. Like when you start making those claims, you get into this really risky gray area. Um, states have different rules in terms of what you can and can't say, but very few of them are allowing you to make medical claims, even when you're talking about medical use. But in the rec side, you can kind of do whatever part, you want. <laughs> talk about whatever you want. I mean, there's restrictions in terms of what you can show and where you can show it. And again, every state's different. I know I keep saying that, but it's the truth. Um, but uh, like common tactics or at least channels, I mean, email marketing is huge. Email and SMS marketing are, are, are massive for both dispensaries and brands, just like they are for most retail businesses, really. I mean, especially e-com focused businesses. And here in Colorado, as in most states, you can place your order online and before you even pick it up in the store. Um, sometimes delivery businesses are like in California, delivery is a big thing now too. I'm trying to think of I'm trying to think of how we sort of change the discussion. I mean, some of it's imagery too. You know, mm -hmm. like a a green cross mm -hmm. just feels medical. Yeah. Huh? Where where like something that's totally different, like if you look at um, candescent, they they're they're orange. Mm -hmm. If you look at light shade, our client, their their little logo is kind of like a half sun sort of thing. And there, there's no cannabis in the name, light shade. Um, so you know, it's you're at that point, you're not just selling the product, you're selling the experience. You're selling what what somebody does when they come into the store, how they're greeted how they receive their products, what kind of packaging it is. You know, the, those are the kind of things you focus on beyond just like, hey, this is going to cure your cancer, which we would never say to anybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm imagining Colorado now is like the most chill state ever. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, South Park is set in Colorado, isn't it? South Park is set in Colorado. And then yeah. you have Towley, who's always getting high. <laughs> like, that's what it is. And he started his own dispensary and Integrity Farm or whatever. Like, was it Stan's dad or whatever in South Park? And they were growing their own, ended up starting growing their own weed in, in Colorado. And I mean, does that actually still happen? Like, is that a thing? Or is that like a, I'm totally obviously, you know, basing this whole thing on South Park. But, you know, it, does that actually happen? People are growing their own weed in the back garden and is that legal and, and like how does that all work yeah yeah you can you can grow your own i'm trying to remember what the rules are um you know it's limited i think it's limited by how many plants you're allowed to have like each person you're allowed to but grow you have to, i want to say four or something and like i'm that, guessing but. you have to do it for personal use you can't be then selling yeah you can't it, right? sell it but right, you can yeah, you can invite your mates around and <laughs> like and smoke it, right? I mean, I think so. It's <laughs> it's certainly for your own use. I I think it, it, you get into trouble when you sell it, right? You know, if you're if you're growing it in your backyard or you've got like your little herb garden with like your <laughs> parsley and turnips and weed next to it, then you're good. Nobody's gonna ever say anything. Nobody, the cops aren't gonna bang on your door for that. No problem. Um, it's when you like actually start trying to turn it into a business, you know, like you're drying it, you're packaging it up, you're trying to sell it to people, then that's, that's illegal. And that you still will get into trouble for. That's crazy. But, um, I guess like when it comes to the cannabis industry, do they get annoyed with how much the CBD industry is still so trendy? Like, you know, so big, is, is, is there some sort of crossover or like, um, yeah, there's, a, there's actually a lot of crossover. I mean, it, there's a lot of brands that have both, you know, like they have mm -hmm. cannabis or like THC products and CBD products oh. um, to kind of satisfy both folks. Because just like you're talking about, there's some people that are interested in the benefits of the plant, but don't want to get high. Um, so there's businesses that, that do both. Um, I wouldn't say that there's any sort of competition between the two, you know, they kind of both serve different, different, parts of the industry different different uh interests in people um and in terms of mso's or that's like multi-state operators so like the bigger cannabis businesses um so the cbd lines that they might have can be sold pretty much nationwide so even though their actual like let's just say thc operations may be limited to certain states they still have an arm of the business that can operate wherever and okay. I think for a lot of them, the idea is when um, when it is federal legal, 
we already have kind of like this roadmap. We already have our brand in a lot of places where it wasn't able to be before. Like we already have the infrastructure, maybe uh, even have warehousing and those kind of things already set up. So, um, so maybe some of them see it as sort of like the, the tip of the spear, like they're, they're, they're way in for when they're able to get in. But, um, but I wouldn't say there's any sort of negativity one way or the other. Do you guys do marketing for CBD companies too? We do. Um, we have one client that we just work on their CBD products. And then we have uh, one or two others that are um, alt cannabinoid. So I don't, this is like a whole nother direction. Yeah. But um, are you familiar with like Delta Eight or HCH or Delta Ten? I, 10 I know of them, but I don't know. I don't couldn't tell you the distinguishing difference between every single one of these products. <laughs> yeah, well, so it, they're they're synthetically really they're synth basically synthetic weed um, right. or synthetic cannabis, but um, they're not quite the same. Like there'll be like a couple molecule difference. I don't understand the science behind it, <laughs> but they uh, they mimic the effects of cannabis without actually being exactly the thing that's banned. Okay. And yeah. is that like, there's a le definite legal legalities around that, I guess, because they're not exactly cannabis. So. Well, that was, that is, so now we're talking about, this is like this gray area <laughs> okay. um, where states haven't, most states haven't necessarily said these products are illegal, but they're also not approved. They, they, they've not been, covered by the FDA or anything like that, that there, there's no testing requirements. Um, so, you know, I think that the, the way things have been going is gradually a lot of states have been banning these alternative cannabinoids. Um, I think there's like 18 or 19 states now that have banned Delta eight products. Uh, so that'll probably continue to happen. But right now, I mean, you can hop online and order Delta 8 gummies or an HCH vape or something like that in pretty much just about any state in the U.S. That's crazy. I, was saying, I, yeah. I still find it so bizarre, like, that, you know, how different it is over there compared to over here and, you know, the, as in the the opinions of what it's like and obviously the laws around it. I, I, I can't imagine it being completely legal but i'm sure it will be I, i'm sure that it will go down that road i mean we i remember i remember a while ago it had people had conversations about it it was being talked about and they lowered the class of the drug and all that kind of stuff so i feel like it's getting that way um yeah it's kind of crazy so it is crazy it's exciting i mean i uh wait let me just tell you a really weird sort of thing that hit me maybe like a year ago um I, I really believe that this industry can be a good thing. It can be a force for good. And if you look at a lot of people that are involved and a lot of the businesses that are involved, far more businesses in this industry have um, good causes attached to them. You know, like, like, like Tom's does the shoe thing and then there's 10 trees that plant trees. There is a lot of that in the cannabis industry. And I think initially the reason for that was because there's such a stigma attached even now there's still a stigma attached to this industry that businesses were looking for ways to show people show the community we're good actors we're we're a good thing um, we we help the community we're, we're not a harm to your children um so because of that that that's where this all sort of came from but it's continued and i hope it still does so i think this is a good thing um i really am excited to play my role in it because I feel like I'm doing something positive. And, uh, you know, like I, I mentioned my four-year-old when she's grown up and cannabis is kind of normal and everywhere. And they, they look back on this time. I think it'd be really cool for her to say, wow, my dad, he was part of that. Oh, that's so cute. And that's such a nice note to land on. I think I feel like that's <laughs> such a sweet thing to do. But I guess I want to I want to ask you um, where people can find you and where people can get in touch because I'll probably have loads of questions about this or you'll get people asking if you can get a discount for them. Like I'm sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, open invitation. Anybody listening to the podcast and wants to come <laughs> visit Colorado, 
you can get in touch with me. I will hook you up with a discount. We can do that for wow, you. Wow, that yeah. is a big, big <laughs> thing. I was um, going to have people lining up at your door now. <laughs> oh, no problem. No problem. Bring the party. Yeah, that'd be good. But in, now in terms of personally, um, I, I, I love talking shop. So if anybody wants to, my email is just jonathan at hybridmarketingco.com and J-O-H-N-A-T-H-A-N. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or just hybridmarketingco.com or, or on LinkedIn, of course, Jonathan McFarlane on LinkedIn. I'm sure I'll pop up. Yeah, I'll pop all those things in the show notes so that everyone's linked to stuff. And uh, cool. But it's been such a fascinating conversation um, hearing all about this. And uh, Yeah, this yeah, is fun. Thank you so much brilliant. for having me. And thank you so much for coming on the show. And thanks everyone for listening. And um, I'll be back next week for another episode of No Bullshit Talks.